especially to you, uh, Sister Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, please rise and join me as we sing God of the Ages. <laughs> from the book of Ruth. It's in the first chapter. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were from Ephrates, from Bethlehem. No, they were Ephratites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two Moabite wives, the name of one was Orpha, and the other name was Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died so that the woman was left with her two sons, without her two sons and her husband. <coughs> then she started to return with her daughter-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she'd been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back each to your own mother's house, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? 
Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do this so to me and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, as you're able, would you stand as we say the Apostles' Creed this morning? It's the normal version this morning. No, no, no subtle changes today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. prepare to pray together this morning we'll be singing hymn of promise church I got a phone call from Ron Baker he said to tell all of his friends that they're alive and well and uh, if you hadn't heard Maxine has three breaks in her right arm just below her shoulder and uh, she's considerably better but it's a long ways to go before she'll be able to do some of the stuff she used to do so uh, just keep them in prayer and they're uh, be happy to get a phone call I'm sure they seem to be doing just fine uh, let's pray Gracious and loving God, we come today on this day 
known most by so many as Halloween, All, Saint, All Hallows' Eve, Dia de la Muerto. It's a day some people have secularized, but it was a religious time. And we thank you for reminding us that there's something bigger and stronger than death. We also know that there'll be tons of people out partying and playing, and we pray for our community to be safe, for children to have fun, and for us to remember that we are in a communion of saints with all of the saints that have gone on before us. We also know that, God, we live in a, in a troubled time, a time when there needs to be more love and less hate, more joy and less fear, and we know that as we get closer to you, we find it easier to see joy in even all of the things going on in our lives. We find it easier to have peace because we know that you hold tomorrow. God, you've called us to be people of faith. You've called us to be your family in this community and throughout the world. And we confess that we sometimes have failed. So as you are a forgiving and loving God, return us to our journey with you. Let us not worry so much about what we haven't done in the past, but what we can do now for your kingdom. Guide us and direct us as we live our lives. We celebrate the upcoming holiday season and we work together to be a community of people that love Jesus Christ. We're also reminded as we near the end of the year that Jesus also traveled a journey that had an end. And as we live through that with him, let us hear his words as a reminder that there's more in the future because he died for us. It's with great joy and the confidence of the children of God that we pray the prayer that he taught us, which said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear from the Gospel of Mark this morning, we're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Join with us as we sing. Receive the names for our Angel Tree kids this year, and we'll be working on ways to get those distributed right after Thanksgiving. So, 
all kinds of excitement. It never ends here. We have pumpkins, and then we have angel tree, and then other things. Uh, I see Brent say, you know, SMU lost. <laughs> it's your fault. That's a good game. You started it off. With, <laughs> it, <laughs> the Astros lost, too. Well, the Astros lost, too, but we're not talking about that. There is a pretty good football game tonight at 730, if you uh, well, you know, we're reading from the Gospel of Mark, and it's in the uh, 12th chapter. As you're able, would you stand for the reading of the Gospel? One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any questions. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. So these two stories today are, are two phenomenal stories in the Bible. Uh, the first one with Ruth is just one of those great stories, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense if you don't do a little research into it. Naomi had moved with her husband to a faraway land, at which time her two sons also married faraway land women. All the men died. Women couldn't own property. So they had nowhere to be, nowhere to stay. Everything was there. You can hear that in Naomi's voice. Do you think I could have more kids, more boys, so you could marry them? They're looking for somebody to lead them. And so they, Naomi, being a wise person, decides to disperse and head on back home. And she tells the two girls to stay in their own land. And Ruth demonstrates some kind of outstanding commitment to her mother-in-law when she says, where you go, I'll go. If you don't get anything else ever out of the book of Ruth, you ought to get that. That's the words that she says are the most famous for the book of Ruth. Where you go, I'll go. You know, in this story in Mark, well, the disciples had just been arguing about who was going to be the greatest. They'd been saying, who's going to be on his left, who on his right? And so now Jesus is there, and, and this, uh, as the story unfolds, one of the scribes came over and heard them talking with each other and saw that there was dispute going on. And he says to Jesus, he's thinking he's going to stir things up. You've probably been in a crowd like that where there's somebody that just likes to stir things up. And he goes in there and he wants to make Jesus look bad. So what he says is, what's the greatest commandment? Well, of course, Jesus is going to answer. He's a Jew. He's going to answer with the first commandment. Lord, love your God. Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your body. Everything. I mean, that's a pretty encompassing statement, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with your whole self. Yourself. Everything about you. And if you're ever able to do that, then... Love your neighbor like you love yourself. <clears throat> Sometimes we wrestle with that because what we're doing to ourselves isn't all that good. If, if you're going to love me like you've been loving yourself, don't. You don't get enough sleep. You don't, you don't take care of yourself. You don't eat properly. You don't live a good lifestyle. That don't, you know, I don't want that kind of love. I want the kind Jesus is talking about here. And it's hard to give that kind of love if you don't have it inside. How do we get that? You know, I learned when I took a lifeguard class, I learned if you don't save yourself, you're not going to save anybody. And so the, uh, most of the lifeguard class was how not to die trying to save somebody else. That's really what it was about. And so we have this, this, this whole concept 
that we're supposed to be selfless and giving. Well, we are, but you can't give what you don't have. There's a little short saying that I like to use sometimes is, you know, it takes a disciple to make a disciple. I'll, I'll put that into Pasadena lingo for you. Sheep make sheep. Sheep don't make dogs or cats. They make sheep. Disciples make disciples. We can't make disciples. We can't fulfill the mission of the United Methodist Church to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world if we're not disciples. We have to work hard at what discipleship means. And there are lots of tests and scores and you can figure out how much of a disciple you are. That's all hogwash in my mind. What kind of a disciple you are is going to show by your actions and what you do and who you are wherever you go, not just in church. How do we treat people when we're out in the world? How do we treat people in the workplace? How does Brent teach the students that he teaches and the co-workers he works with? Because I can assure you, I lived with a teacher for 38 years. They don't always like all the kids or the co-workers, but you got to work with them. Jesus didn't say his commandment is to go out and like all these idiots that live in the world around you. <laughs> what he said was go out and love all these people because I made them too. Amen. And that's the big challenge because there's a bunch of them that are not that lovable. And if Jesus can love them and we're supposed to be disciples, then we have no choice but to love them too. Now, the thing about Jesus is that, that Jesus... Is a, is a free will kind of a guy. I mean, it would be so much easier if he would just uh, make us do this, right? But he doesn't want anybody to be made to do it. This is not a mandate. You know, Jesus isn't saying, go out and love everybody like you love yourself tomorrow or you'll go to hell. No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is, if you willingly follow me and if you willingly do that, then the kingdom of God is available to you right now. It's your choice. And that is our choice. We get to make that choice in this room. But friends, there are people living outside of this room that haven't ever had that opportunity to make that choice. They don't know what the benefit is. You know how that works, right? The, the benefits outweigh the cost. It's a value proposition. You know what I'm talking about? In other words, the benefits of having electricity in your home outweigh the cost of having electricity bills come to your house once a month. Uh, the benefits of driving a car uh, considered against the opportunity to walk everywhere you go. Uh, you, know, you know, there's always a way to look at what's the benefit. Well, have you considered the benefit of being a disciple? I mean, there is no benefit greater than eternity. There's no benefit greater than to be welcomed and loved by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but not just when you die, today. So many times we spend our, I titled this message today, In Search of the Kingdom. We spend an inordinate amount of time trying to live a certain way so we'll get to go to heaven. We miss out on the journey. Heaven is available right here, right now, today. And if it wasn't so, Jesus wouldn't have included it in his prayer when he says Help us to make it like it is in heaven on earth. Now, he wants us to be doing that. How do we do it? Well, we start loving people. We get away from some of the discord and the hostility. And, and I, I don't know how you do that in today's world because it's everywhere. I mean, you can be, you got to be really careful what you say to family members or you may not get a Christmas present this year. I mean, you know, it's, it's that serious in our families. And the only way it's going to change is for us to change the conversation. I'm not saying you shouldn't talk about politics or religion with your friends and family, because absolutely you really should. But talking about it's different than hating each other and throwing rocks at each other and calling each other names. Mm -hmm. Talking about it simply means that you can start off from the beginning. We may not agree at the end of this, but I'm willing to hear how you feel. And if somebody's got to start that process, it's not happening in Washington. It's not happening in Austin. It's probably not happened down there on whatever street our city hall's on now. They move it around a lot. 
But it can start happening in our community around us right now. It can happen around our dinner tables, around other places. When I was growing up, my mother had a cousin who taught at the old South Texas Junior College, which is now part of UH downtown. He was a biology professor. He was really smart. He'd written a lot of books. He was all but dissertation to have his doctorate. And uh, he'd written all these books they used for tests and stuff. He went on vacation with us a lot. And, you know, I made the mistake one time of saying something about, oh, those are cedar trees. And he went on to tell me, no, there's not cedar trees. They're juniper trees. There's no cedar trees in this part of them. That's the way our vacation would go, right? And, uh, and so then I had a, my dad had a cousin who was a merchant marine. He was a big, tall guy. He was the head steward. He was the cook on Likes Lines ships. Uh, Henry, when he retired, he knew how to cook a lot of food, but only for a lot of people. And he lived with just his wife. We'd go over there and he'd cook a pan of something and be in a, in a bowl this big. He didn't know how to cook for just two. These two guys were very smart, learned in different ways. One was college educated, one had been all over the world. And they would get together at our house for Thanksgiving every year and we would have knockdown drag outs between these two people. I remember Henry, big tall Henry, looking at little short Shan one time and saying, you're a yellow dog Democrat. And Shan said, I sure am. <laughs> and you know after a little while the argument would slow down somebody would holler and we'd all go sit to eat and we'd hold hands and we'd pray and we had the greatest time among good friends yeah. everybody knew that everybody didn't agree about everything nobody has agreed yet about everything in the United Methodist Discipline or the Southern Baptist whatever they call theirs that, that you don't ever agree with all of that stuff that's not the point the point is that we've got two point some odd billion Christians on this planet that need to unite and change the world in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how simple it is. Amen. We need to quit worrying about whether we got more people in the seats than they do at the church down the street or whether we got a bigger budget than the ones down the street or whether we got a bigger playground. That's all irrelevant. This church doesn't have some of the stuff they have in other churches, but we've got some stuff they don't. And our task is to be better than 10,000 other churches at what we do, not what they do. And in my mind, the thing we need to be working on in 2021 and 22 and 23 is on being better at discipleship. Being better disciples. Knowing who we are. Knowing where we are in God's call. Now, i got to admit, there was a lot of years I didn't know where I was in it. I was never quite sure what my task was. I wasn't even sure when the bishop laid her hands on me and ordained me what was going to be the future. But I knew God had a plan and I was willing to go where God asked me to go. Well, as it turned out, I had made a comment to the boss one day, the, the preacher, I was just a layperson at the church, and I made a comment to him that I might think about going to seminary. Kathy had sort of semi said it would be okay. And it was something I was considering. And I said, but I would have to work somewhere else. I said, I can't work 60, 70, 80 hours a week and, and do that. Well, I wasn't expecting it, but a couple, a couple of months later, he called me up and said, the church is going to hire you. You're going to be something called a pastoral assistant. You'll help me. You'll do stuff around the church. You can preach and do other stuff, but you just can't do some things that preachers do. And, uh, and that way you can quit your job and go to seminary. So it sounded good to me, so I quit my job. I was making a lot of money at that time. My mother thought I had lost my mind. Uh, she said, you were making like $175,000 a year, and now you're going to make twenty six. dollars Huh? But mom grew up during the Depression. She had a different understanding of the world, and it was okay. Well, so anyway, I went to go to seminary. Well, of course, they didn't accept me at first. It took some effort. Uh, because I'd been out of my undergrad was like in 1972, it was a long time ago, and so I finally got admitted. Well, just to, to make that story a little shorter, at, at SMU, Perkins School of Theology, a, a Master of Divinity, which is what I have, was 85 semester hours. A regular master's, like if you get it in public administration or something, is either 30 or 35, 36 hours. Um, a Master's of Divinity was 85 hours. That's a, roughly the same as a law degree, it's a, called a terminal degree. And so the price for tuition at SMU is $500 a semester hour. 
All right, so it's time to add, right? 500 times 85, I, I, I think it works out to about $45,000. Well, that was a pretty big deal. I wasn't sure where my future was going, but I wasn't sure I was going to do that either. And, but I did know that if I went to school, that, that Kathy was going to be, because, you know, we hadn't been married all that long, and we still, even today, like to do stuff together. And, and I was pretty sure she's going to come home from work and say, well, let's go out to eat or let's do this. And I was going to have to say, well, I got to study. And that wasn't going to work out. So I suggested, and we went and enrolled her at Laterno University, where she got her bachelor's degree while I was getting my seminary degree. Now, I say all that because we didn't have, the, I don't know how much Laterno cost. It was a bunch. It's a private school. But we didn't have that much money in the bank. And I took a big pay cut to get there. And I did all of my seminary work in three and a half years with no debt. And I tell you that because when you're getting to do what God wants you to do, God will make it so. Now, how did that happen? Well, there were discounts because I applied for financial aid and other things. I got some scholarships from this, this, and that. But, but the, the bottom line is it looked un inconceivable, undoable, not possible. But it was possible. One of the things I think that, that leads us to, to the story of Ruth is that her life seemed absolutely unmanageable and out of control. Everybody that possibly could have helped her had died. And the one that was willing to help her told her to go home. And Naomi really has no resources to help her. Now the story unfolds and it gets better as time goes along. You know, it wouldn't have, if it didn't get better, it wouldn't have made the book. <laughs> but, but Naomi is followed by Ruth because of Ruth's faithfulness and it ultimately it's Ruth's faithfulness that changes Naomi's life now you don't know whether you're that person for someone else or not I promise you you influence people that you don't think you influence I tell Ron and Maxine every time when they're here in church 59 years of marriage I mean that's that is an influencer for the rest of people. people get to see actually there is somebody that can be married for 59 years because in our world today, I think somebody told me the average marriage lasts eight years. Oh, goodness. You know, so it's a different world. But what we have here is we have these two stories that kind of fit together somehow or another where Ruth becomes the person that changes Naomi's life even though Ruth is the unsuspected, unlikely, not probable person in the story. And the same thing happens in the, the story from Mark where it's a guy trying to make fun of Jesus when it's a guy trying to show that Jesus is a crackpot that eventually elevates Jesus to the place where he gets to tell us there are really only two commandments that matter. Love God, love yourself, and love your neighbor. He says there are none more important than these, and when you follow these, you get the opportunity to experience the kingdom. So here we are in 2021. It's nearing the end, actually. Church is kind of coming back. We've got more people sometimes than we have had. Other times, not so much. People are still afraid. I, I'm in the pumpkin patch out there a few days this last week, and a lot of people come out there, and they're going to wear a mask the whole time. Good for them, if that makes them feel better. I had several people from other uh, cultures drive up and pull up along there and ask, is it okay for us to come into your pumpkin patch? Mm. You know, this is 2021. Of course it's okay for them to come in. When we said everybody's welcome, everybody's welcome. But they were coming because they were, they were of a different race or a different culture or a different skin color or they spoke a different language. They wanted to know if we would welcome them. That makes me sad. But it also elevates for me the reality that there's people driving by on this street and this street over here that are thinking the same thing. I wonder if it'd be okay for us to go there. And, you know, we try to tell them. Last night I had a friend who came to church. His name is Cyril. He's from Nigeria. Uh, it's a little, kind of a long story about Cyril, but he used to be my orchid termite man and then he quit working for Orkin and went into the real estate business and he sold some houses for Kathy. And in fact, it was the first houses he ever sold. And so he's, we kind of have a special place in Cyril's life. 
Cheryl came from Nigeria. She told two stories that really moved me greatly when I first heard Cyril talk. The first one was when they came here, him and his buddies checked into a motel or a hotel somewhere, and they turned on the shower, and it didn't have a timer, and they could just stand there under running water forever, because you see at home, they have no running water. I asked Cyril what it was like when he was going to school. He said, every morning I'd get up, I'd get a big clay pot. I'd have to carry it about five miles to get water for my mother. I'd have to carry it back full about five miles for my mother before I went to school. And I said, well, Cyril, what happens if you just break it? He said, then she gives me another pot and I go back again. Oh, my God. As I was talking to him last night, he said, the people in this country, none of them can understand the poorest of the poor that we have here are wealthy compared to where he's from. We have so much to offer, not just as a church, but as people of God, we have so much to offer. Don't let the world's angst and animosity stop you from being who Jesus called you to be. Those friendships, those relationships, they are life changing for people that you may never, ever get to know. My mom taught second grade. I remember as a teenager going with her to the store and she'd run across some kid that, or some parent of a kid that she had taught 25 years before. And that teacher, that person would come up to my mom and say, what a difference that second grade made. Mom had no idea how many people she had influenced, but neither do you. You just don't have any idea. And so I think we need to live in a way that demonstrates so we can, so we can experience this part where Jesus would say to us, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And I think when that happens, you'll know it. Those moments of joy, those moments of fulfillment, those moments that you feel like, you know, at least for this few minutes, I did something God would have wanted me to do. It's kind of a difficult passage to talk about. But I want to reiterate for you what Jesus says. When he answers about it, he says the first commandment, of course, is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of it, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. If that's the challenge for me today, I already have to confess that I've failed. But that's my goal for tomorrow. All of my mind, all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my strength to work for the kingdom of God. That's where we came up with our mission statement here at the church. We want to be the heart and the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ for this community and for the world. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I apologize for my froggy voice today, my radio announcer kind of voice. You should have heard it yesterday morning when I couldn't talk. It would have been like this. But it's better today. We're going to now sing, His Name is Wonderful. It's a great hymn. As you're able, would you please stand as we sing. You know we don't pass the offering plate. Our baskets in the back. We're glad to accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings. <coughs>
that everybody has a good evening today and safe. And if there's kids trick or treating, be careful if you're out driving around. I hope that we all enter into the new year or the new month with a with a joyful spirit. I will say that next week is All Saints. We'll be celebrating All Saints here in the sanctuary on Saturday night and Sunday. Uh, one of the things I like to do, if, if it, you know, the All Saints Day celebration means we remember those who have gone on before us. When we come to communion for All Saints, we also know that we're at the communion table with all those who have gone on before us. If you have a memento or a picture or something you'd like to bring and put up here in front as you come and we celebrate communion to help us remember that they're here with us now, feel free to do that. Uh, All Saints Day is, is a special day. Technically, All Saints Day is tomorrow, uh, but I didn't figure you wanted to come back tomorrow, so we'll do it next weekend. <laughs> it's in the name of God that we meet together. It's the teachings of Jesus that lead us and the power of the Holy Spirit that get us through. Amen. 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 Amen.